thanks very much, Penny, and thanks, Peter. And now I think we can go to some questions. I see we have a couple of hands up here. Um, Congratulations, Penny. And thank you, Peter Humanware. Let's go to Caroline. Yeah, um, Peter, so I'm curious. Um, you said that when you put the, um, you ha that you have to take a Word document and bring it up in Duxbury or whatever, or translator it before you can send it to the Braille note. But if you, if the Braille note can um, uh, natively accept a DLCX file, is there really, what's the need for the translation? So that is an awesome question. And to answer it, it's because it's math. So you can certainly open a DOCX file that contains math in it. Let's say you read me math. So let's say uh, you have the, a document that contains math and, and it will read fine. However, if that is spatial math, so if you have one third plus two thirds equals, you know, blank, what will happen is when you try to open that in keyword, it's not going to show up as visual math. It's going to show up as math speak. So it will say one open frac, the words open frac, over, you know, one open frac one over three plus open frac because it cannot display that content visually. So the reason why you want to take that in as a Braille document is so that you can copy it and turn it into visual math that is visually accurate on the output side of things. Okay. That, that's mainly why you would do that for that content. If you're doing simple math, so if you're just doing two plus two equals four, you can certainly do that straight away um, because it'll, it'll work fine because those symbols can be shown. When you start getting into superscripts and subscripts and uh, fractions and that sort of visual math, that is where key math allows you to display that visually and it, and it will take it a step further. So you would ideally be converting that using key BRF and, and, and kind of doing it that way so that you're not automatically applying that translation when you open the DOCX file on the word processor. Okay. Thank you. No problem. It's a, it's a great question. And it, and it would be one that looks like, well, the, you know, keyword technically opens DOCX files. So why couldn't we just open it there? And, and, it, and that, that would essentially be why. Thank you. Uh, TJ. Sorry, did you call mine? Yes. You're on oh, sorry. Yep. We're, uh, me and Aaron were in a, sort of a discussion about exactly that, uh, the subject of Braille displays. Uh, um, I get a question I have, and it's the, one of the chief, chief questions I think maybe a lot of people have is the aspect of, okay, these Braille displays are very expensive, right? And to be able to obtain one, and then having it update for a few years and then they don't update anymore so then you're basically stuck with trying to get another braille display you're stuck with old technology you're stuck with old technology that doesn't update yeah. um is there <clears throat> any type of plans to improve how many years that these things can be used because anywhere from five grand to ten grand for a braille displays is quite a bit of money to ask for people that don't have a huge income I love it. So it, it's a great question. And I, I think I'd frame it through the lens of any assistive technology. Um, when we look at it, and I work a lot with individuals who are deafblind, um, individuals who use AAC devices, individuals who use lots of different products. And unfortunately, the world we live in, um, if, even if I think of very mainstream products, you know, we are living in a world where the standard a standard, you can pick any standard, generally will change in a sort of a half-life concept. So what changed over 10 years becomes something that changes over five years, becomes something that changes in shorter periods of time. When we look at Braille technology or any AT, we try to build products that will be it provide us with longevity of a minimum of five years. With that being said, there are still many devices out there that you can get to work with future iterations of any operating system, depending on what the sort of the time you're willing to put into it. That is also dictated though by the mainstream operating system. So if, if you wanted to use, let's just say an iPhone 6 with your braille display, you're going to be able to use that until Apple says it's no longer going to work. And you know, we, we don't have control over that side of things. 
the same thing would be true with switches. I know there's a lot of uh, discussion about accessing, especially AAC and, and augmentative communication. And it's not just a blindness piece, right? It's a, it's It really is an assistive technology piece where the balance between creating products that are useful and helpful um, and then creating the products that will last. We we certainly, if we could create a product that gave us more of 10 years, so the, the Braille Note Apex is a great example of something that we supported for over 12 years. And we would have continued to support it, but there's no more parts. We, we just cannot get the parts for it. it. It's impossible. They're gone. And, you know, I, I think we would love to be able to say, well, we're going to support this product for 15 years. But the reality is we nobody can do that. We, we just can't do that. Now, what we can do is work on ways to bring the cost down of the of the technology of the patents of the of the methods by which this stuff is created some companies have tried to do that and have done it successfully some have done it very unsuccessfully um, to bring down the cost of assistive technology because when you bring that cost down you then bring down your level of support or where products are are dealt with where products are are made how products are serviced so it because we're also dealing with the the reality that our market right, where we know is very fixed. And so we, we don't have that leverage that uh, we can just rely on new consumers every year. We, we certainly know that. And we're not here to, to try and, and monetize that. So it, it's a really good question. And I know it comes from the, the place of this stuff is expensive. And, and I know, I mean, I'm, I'm a blind person who purchases technology, um, who purchases all sorts of things. And I, I buy products and they, they become obsolete. Um, and I also meet individuals who are still clinging to products because they love them so much and they don't want them to be obsolete or they just don't have the funds or the means to replace product um, and, and it becomes a challenge. So I, with, with that side of it, I always say, you know, there are always methods. So in Canada, depending on your province, right? I mean, is it, all right, can, are, do you have access to funding through the STEP program, through ADP, through uh, RAMQ, through, through, through various places, depending on where you may be? Um, in the States, it can differ state by state. In Europe, it's very different depending on your country. But, you know, the methods, um, I think long term, we need to look at just how we can start to to bring down the cost of the overall product. And we've seen that. We have seen that. It's not been as much as, as we would like to. But I would argue that neither has mainstream technology, right? A phone 10 years ago or 12, 15 years ago, a flip phone, you could walk into AT&T, into a store, get a flip phone for... 50 to 150, right? 150 bucks and leave. Uh, I went yesterday because I'm one of those people who clings to my iPhone until it just won't work. I was using an iPhone 7. I went to the iPhone 12 Pro and it is not $50. I'll tell you that right now. Um, <laughs> and you have to pay for it over a long period of time. And so, you know, we're seeing now the phone, a phone, a good phone that's going to get you several years of usage will be $1,000. And that's mm -hmm. mainstream technology. So it's, it's, a, it's a question I get a lot and I totally understand and, and we understand at humanware and we've certainly tried to make more hybrid products as well that aren't going to be just this full-fledged note taker side of things um, we also certainly want to still provide the same level of service uh, and customer service and be able to to participate in things that you know that our users expect so I, I certainly certainly hear you I wish I wish there was a guarantee or something we could do I think the same is true for any manufacturers of any assistive technology to guarantee the life cycle of a product being a decade, but I, I, I just don't think that's something we'll see. But that doesn't mean that if you're not creative, you can't use a product for longer than it's intended use. There are many people out there using products from the 90s or the 2000s. I see, I meet them almost every day or every show I go to, um, who certainly use products for a long time. So I think we've got a couple minutes, and we've got two questions left. Uh, sure. Lori, hey there, um, Peter. Lovely presentation. I'm a TVI. I work with a student in grade 10. We've been working on using the, the Braille Note Touch Plus for math, math 10. Um, what we're doing, and I'm, maybe I'm just doing it incorrectly, is that she types out the question, then she answers it, and then each time she finishes one question, she puts it into the key word. Yes. As it, it becomes then a PDF. Is that correct? So or something like that. Well, the, the preview would be a PDF. The document you want your, your student to send you is the keyword file. It should be coming to you as a DOCX file. It should be yes, a Microsoft yes. Word document. Okay, yes, you're, you're correct. I'm, yeah, thank you. So what I, my question to you today is how many lines, like we're, we're finding that um, a certain number of lines in, in, in a question or a group of questions 
um, need to be transferred otherwise it fills up is yes. that correct okay and yes what is, so and ideally ideally it would be about 10 to 12 lines per image so if and, and again right. that, so if you're doing a geometric proof that could be three images right it, it could be a lot yeah ideally though so when we first launched KeyMath, we didn't have a limitation and what happened is that because we're generating an image that image needs to fit within the normal layout of a page and so what happened was we had kiddos doing 50 60 80 lines which is fine for the braille reader but when you compress that into a picture you couldn't even read it with a magnifying glass <laughs> um, it was becoming extremely extremely small so we had to we realized very quickly that that was not going to be viable a viable solution um, when somebody was taking an exam and they try to turn it in and it has just tons of fine print um, so we we do restrict you to about 12 lines per image and i will say that this is something we're looking at reworking. We want to find a way just to do the math directly in the keyword file. Um, so that key math kind of is, is more of a seamless overlay and you can you can just kind of do as, as much as you need to and the picture is then calibrated at the back end um, and not needed to be going through all the sort of steps. So I, I do think we'll see some movement there. I don't know when, I know it's something we get quite a bit. Uh, folks really don't want to, to be limited. They want to, you know, seamlessly just type in the keyword essentially and just have it kind of stay in, in math. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I agree with that. It takes a lot of time to, because I'm busy, we just do it as a dictation and I dictate them. Right. She goes, no, no, wait, I have to still transfer it over. Now just wait a second. <laughs> sure. Okay, okay, now you can go. <laughs> right. So right. yeah, I would appreciate the, the update on whenever you guys get that going. Sure, that's great. Thank you. Thank okay, you. one last question from Kim. Kim still muted. muted. Sorry about that. I was chattering <laughs> away and I was muted. Um, uh, just a really quick question. I was wondering about people actually working in the fields of uh, STEM or STEAM. Um, are they sh using this kind of process to share with colleagues? Has it improved the work capabilities of people working, blind people working in these fields? So. I, I love it. And we had the National Coding Symposium uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, APH hosted it and, and we were a, a sponsor as were some other companies. And in there, we had some blind programmers um, and I was was talking with a blind mathematician who was using this to communicate with peers. Now, again, it's great and it is being used. So to answer your question, yes, it's being used to show content, but, but where it needs to come to kind of come full circle is to be able to receive or consume content. So um, it is being used, especially in higher education, Kim. So that's really where we're seeing the biggest difference outside of just, just oh, I'm in, you know, grade 10 or grade 12 doing math. Kiddos who are, who are going into college and then are able to actually participate in higher level math because they can show their professors what they're doing. Um, we've seen a huge improvement there. In the field, in the field, so to, to I don't have any concrete outside of just a couple of people I've met here and there who do use this technology I don't have any sort of widespread adoption but then again there is not necessarily widespread adoption of blind individuals working in STEM fields um, usually we meet them and they're you know that they're they're an exception which which we're working to change we really want to change that um, and and so I think as we go forward, we will see more of this make an inroad, especially just with the prevalence of technology. And we know that the money and the jobs uh, that are available in those fields are, are, are everywhere. So uh, I think we'll start to really start to hear more of those folks who are using this and, and really Braille in general um, as a means to check their code, to check their programming, to receive things from their colleagues, to receive information or, um, and, and be able to participate. So I, I think it'll come um, as of right now, it's not something we have a ton of data on, though. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. I Thank will you. turn it back to Natalie now. Yes. Rock and roll. Excellent. Um, very exciting, Peter. I have to say that as a as a researcher, I I use the Braille Note Touch among a variety of other tools to do my work. So I'm just very excited to to hear about all these these things that Humanware is working on to increase access to these subjects. So thank you so much. And thank you everyone for the questions. Um, yeah, it was wonderful. And I hope everyone has an awesome weekend and I cannot wait to, uh, I can't wait to give everyone a hug. Honestly, I want to get up there and see everybody. It's killing me. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Oh, gosh. Soon, so. soon, exactly.
exactly. One day in person, we'll have exactly. this symposium in person. 